أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين A companion had an axe in his hand and just as he was about to strike, to chop the wood he heard he heard the mightiest call that exists on this earthly inhabitants. A call that resonates at least five times throughout the entire globe. He heard Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Immediately when he heard this mighty and powerful call. He forgot about the wood that was in front of him. He dropped his axe and responded without hesitation to his powerful and mighty call. Saying, La burika fi talqatin nudiya alayha salah. There is no blessing, listen carefully. There is no blessing, he said, for any strike. When Allahu Akbar is mentioned and one does not respond. There is no blessing in anything that you do. While well, Allahu Akbar is being pronounced, called, if you do not abandon that which you are doing and respond to the call of Allah is the greater. Allah is greater than anything that comes to your mind. This great call is indeed the essence, the symbol, the cornerstone of every single Muslim. For surely there is no power equal to the power of the one true deity. Hence the Jews of Medina didn't like it. The pagans of Arabia were not happy with it. In fact, the US, the US dollar, as you all know, announces to the entire world, in God we trust. So why should anyone have a problem with Allahu Akbar? Is it not the same thing they supposedly agree with? Why do people feel uncomfortable, uneasy, pressured, intimidated, provoked, even threatened when this mighty call is being announced? The answer, my dear beloved brethren and sisters, lies not in the actual saying itself per se, the answer to this question lies very deep. It lies in the understanding, the recognition, and indeed the acceptance of Allah Akbar. How many of us hear it, see it, speak it? A Muslim, let me rephrase my word, a true Muslim, when he or she hears this powerful statement that rocks every inch of this globe, that shakes the earth within, where even the heavenly creatures prostrate upon hearing it. 
a true believer, a true Muslim, when he or she hears it, immediately without hesitation, with an open, present heart, mind, soul, spirit, they drop everything that they are doing. They abandon their worldly desires and they respond to the call of Allahu Akbar with delight, with love, with belief. Look at this. Allahu Akbar. Have you ever thought of this image? This is complete surrender. Complete submission. We do this every time we initialize that which is called prayer, which is one of the most beloved acts to Allah. Allah, you are the greatest. Better words, Allah is the greater because Allah is the greatest is Allahul Akbar. Because Allahul Akbar which is Allah is the greatest and there is Allahu Akbar Allah is greater this is the definition this is the greatest manifestation of complete and absolute servitude an introspection within the body of a believer when he raises his hand and says Ya Allah you are greater you are greater than my political my cultural my social my ethnical interests you are greater than my problems, pains, and worries. You are greater than my grief, my anxiety, my depths, my fear, my work. Ya Allah, you are greater than my parents, my boss, my children, my siblings, my relatives, my cousins, my friends, my enemies. Ya Allah, you are greater than my whims and desires and everything that exists. I am pretty sure now you know what Allahu Akbar means. Because if you do not, then you better learn and implement. This is the definition of Allahu Akbar. So when a true believer, a true believer, he recognizes this. That Allah is greater and when he believes in it and implements and acknowledges it, he realizes without any shadow of a doubt that the power of the entire existence becomes illusory nothing. There's no power equal to Allah. You are claiming that you believe and you acknowledge and you accept Allah is greater. So what power can be greater? B-52 plane, warplanes, missiles, A, B, C, D, nothing is greater than Allahu Akbar. A believer treasures this in his heart. But if you do not believe this, then the power and the support of the entire world, both man and jinn, for us will be not nothing. The true believer knows and accepts that the manipulation of all those people that are always telling you what they can and what they cannot do to you is nothing. It doesn't bother you. What can they do? Is not Allah greater than them? Is He not their creator? What are you scared of? What are you worried about? You're a Muslim. A Muslim is not a person who's provoked, who's tempted, he was intimidated by anything or anyone. Now we know why and realize why the claims to all the powers are affected by it. We also realize why those who are proud of accountability are not happy with it. We also realize those who are stubborn, arrogant, egotistical smugs, if you would like, are also scared of it the question is where do you stand with Allah you know you should ask yourselves I can't answer that question for you 
Where do you stand, O believer, O Muslim? Where do I stand with Allah? Where does Allah stand with me? A very important question. Does it come first in your life? Or does it come when you have time? Allah. Are you going to be like the companion who immediately once he heard this mighty call drop his axe, drop everything and respond? Or are you going to be like the majority of people on this earthly existence who break buckle and shake? I haven't got time. I haven't got time for Allah Akbar. Maybe later. I haven't got time. I am too busy. I am too busy watching television, playing games, toying around, on my holidays, fishing, counting my money, building my homes, washing my car, arguing with my wife about the colour of the kitchen tiles. I am too busy with this stupidity and nonsense, with my selfish, foolish desires. Shame on you. Shame on you, shame on you. And you claim to be a Muslim. And you claim to love Allah. And you claim that you acknowledge Allah is greater. You acknowledge nothing. Wallahi, you acknowledge nothing. How many people do we see in this state? Rushing through their prayers, chasing the dunya, not realizing that the one that you are abandoning in prayer, the one that you are running from, is in fact the one who is in control of the very thing that you are chasing. SubhanAllah. The one that you are abandoning to chase is the one that is the one that gives you that in the first place who has control over all this do it right and you get what you want stop praying your prayers as though it's some kind of cardiovascular exercise stop praying your prayers as though it's a hit and run hit now I saw me but run Someone saw you. <laughs> He's over there. He always sees you. You can, you can think that, but he always sees you. He always sees you, subhanAllah. With Samuel al Basir. Understand that. There's a narration that actually says that the greatest thief is the one that steals from his prayers. In other words, it is not correct. His bowing or his sujood. He's the greatest thief according to Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hudayfa ibn Yaman once saw a man praying where his bowing was incorrect. So he approached him. He said, how long have you pray, been praying like this for? He said, for 40 years, the man replied. And if you were to die on this path, while you're bowing like that, wallahi, you will die on a path other than the path of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ibrahim al Nahri, one of the champions from Amman's Tabi'in, he said, in the past, if we were to take knowledge or wanted to take knowledge from a particular individual, before we took that knowledge, we observed his prayer. If his prayer was according to the sunnah, not the sunnah of my father and mother, mind you, but the sunnah of the real sunnah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. If it was according to the sunnah of Muhammad, we accepted it. Otherwise, we throw it. We don't want his knowledge. If you're an implementer, what kind of knowledge is this? The companions, listen carefully. 
when they entered prayer, when they said Allahu Akbar and they started praying, they left the worldly affairs, they left the dunya where you left your shoes out there. That's where the dunya belongs, underneath your souls. It's not even worth your soul, mind you. That's where it belongs. Not in the masjid. Not in your prayer. Abu Lu'lu, al khabith al Majusi. The Zoroastrian, Persian, filthy, disgusting, coward, fire worshipper. He attacked Umar, Amir al Mu'mineen al Farooq, this mountain, when, when he was praying Fajr. Now, besides being a coward, why would this Persian, filthy, disgusting individual attack a mountain, al Farooq, in prayer? Because he knew even this Persian. The Zoroastrian worshipper knew that when the companion said Allahu Akbar, it was not the utterance of the deluded. He knew that when the companion said Allahu Akbar, it wasn't the utterance of the absent minded or the ignorant, foolish individual. No. He knew that when they said Allahu Akbar, even this Persian fire worshipper knew that when the companion said Allahu Akbar, it came from the innermost regions of this morsel, their heart. It was an utterance that was strong and powerful. Hence, when Amir al-Mu'mineen initiated Fajr prayer, saying Allahu Akbar, immediately he fell into a state of complete servitude. Immediately he fell in a state of absolute introspection. The wall to him did not exist. It was dark other than the place, the light that shined before him. And then, and only then, did this filthy coward, who could not stand before Omar, Omar would have to just look at him and fall. Then and only then, he stabbed him with his filthy, poisonous dagger repeatedly until he fell down. Radiallahu anhu. And then he stabbed 14 other companions. So Abdul Rahman ibn Awf steps forward and finishes the Fajr prayer. Shortens it. They carry Amir al muminin to his bed. They put him on his bed. The doctor comes in. He gives him a cup of milk. He drinks it, Omar. And it comes out of his womb, solid and white, just as he drank it. The doctor looks at al Farooq and tells him, Recommend someone to succeed you. This is the end. Omar said to the doctor, you have spoken the truth. And had you said anything else, I would not have believed you. And then he started slipping into unconsciousness, in and out of consciousness. And it was called, don't let him lose consciousness. And who was there? No other than Abdullah ibn Abbas. And Abdullah ibn Abbas, bear in mind, he was the one that was sitting in his shura and remind him when it was time for what? For prayer. So he said, I know the remedy. I know the medicine that will wake him up no matter what state he may be in. What was the remedy? Ya Amir al Mu'minin, as salat Oh, commander of the faithful, it's prayer time. He opened his eyes like a lion ready to attack its prey. He opened his eyes and he said, listen carefully to what he said. A dying man on his bed and yet what is on his mind and what is on his lips? لا إيمان لمن لا صلاة له. There is no faith for the one who does not pray. This is a person who's dying. That's all that is important to him. 
and was it not important to the greater one that is better than Umar? Our beloved teacher himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wasn't he sleeping into consciousness and out of consciousness and, and, and? And every time he regained consciousness, he would say, As-salatu, as-salat! وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ He would sleep into uh, unconsciousness. He would wake up. As-salat, as-salat! He would sleep. He would wake up. As-salat, as-salat! And they were the last words of his nubuwa. Then you get this idiot that comes around today. And it was in the past. And it will be to the end of days. Now, so that is not that important. It's not that important. Iman is in the heart. Not that important. Well, according to Amir al muminin and one that's greater than him, and one that's greater than him. No. La iman al iman la salat alahu. And I prefer to take from someone like them than this ignorant fool. As the Kaaba was being built. What was on the tongue, the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam as he was putting the stones to the Ka'b? What was his dua? Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min dhurriyati. This is our goal. This is our aim in life. This is Ibrahim building the Ka'ba while making this dua. Ya Allah, make me amongst those who pray. And make my children amongst those who establish prayer's wall. When our beloved teacher وسلم, informed him about the Dajjal, the Antichrist, he was telling his companions about the Antichrist and that he'll be on this earth for 40 days when he comes out. One day or the, or the first day will be equal how many years? How many days? You can tell me. The first day will be equal to what? One year. The second day will be what? One month. The third day will be what? One week. And the rest, the subsequent days, like our days. When they heard that, the companions, what they say? What was on their mind? What were they thinking of? What was important to them? Ya Rasulullah, They told me that prayer is not important. Ya Rasulullah, how do we pray? If it's that the situation, how can we determine prayer? The most important thing to them. Why? Because they knew that prayer, a salat, is the identity, the license, if you would like, of every single one who says is a Muslim. Even during war, when the fighting is at its peak, one still has to pray according to the Sharia of Allah. And yet, we have these people that say, No, it's not important. My heart is good, my tongue is good, I'm good. There's no problem in that. Al-Iman bil-Qalb. Do not feel or take prayer, whatever you do, as something monotonous. Be very wary of this. It is actually scary. There is no greater deed on the face of this earthly existence that one can do that is more blessed than Salat. No greater deed. Listen to this Bedouin. He asked Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a very simple but a very important question and that is Ya Rasulullah What is the most blessed deed that one can do? The answer was just as such simple but extremely important As-salatu ala waqtiha The most important person that a Muslim can do. As-salatu ala waqtiha. Prayer at its proper time. Do not trivialize this. This is why you exist. This deed is why you exist. In the entire sunnah of our beloved Prophet 
the only time he was taken up to a divine audience was for the message of prayer. Prayer is so wallahi important that he was called to the presence of the divine. Prayer is so important that he was called to the presence of the Jabbar al Mutakabbir, and there he gave him a direct message to give to us to pray regularly. That was the message. All the way from this earth to above the low tree and beyond, nothing between him is Lord and himself but a veil a veil a curtain if you would like of light Allah spoke to him directly and informed him about this obligation of prayer surely that is important surely that is our main concern surely we should be concerned about this Salat, ya ikhwati wa ya akhwati la izzat, does not revolve around your lives. Salat does not revolve around your world. Rather, your world, your existence, your being, your work, your love, your joy, your social behavior, your everything revolves around one and only one thing. A salat. That comes first. Everything, anything after that, is second nature to you. Again, we have many, many individuals who don't understand this. And will never understand it. Forgetting that initially how much prayers was obligated, you can tell me. 50 prayers, Ahsanta ya Akhir Aziz. Initially, 50 prayers was the obligation. Imagine this was the case today. Your day will be consumed of just one thing, composed of wudu, of salat, of wudu, of salat. You'll never lose your wudu probably. You probably hardly eat. Isn't there in this a message? Brothers and sisters, think about this. What can we extrapolate from this? Surely think about it. If this was the essence of prayer, 50 prayers, what do we learn? A spiritual message in this. For those who are wise, for men of understanding, for men of belief. There's a message in it. And that is, our purpose of existence is salat. This is why we exist. But due to his infinite benevolence, mercy, wisdom, he reduced it to only five out of his love, care for us, but rewards us for 50. Now if this is not a loving creator, I'm not sure what is. If this is not a law that cares for you, I'm not sure what is. And you get people that don't even care. Allah loves you to pray. He wants you to pray. He wants you to purify yourselves. One of the most essential elements of the declaration of salvation is what? Al-Mahabba. A condition of faith. In other words, we love Allah and the Rasulullah more than we love ourselves. And we love whatever he loves. And guess what? He loves prayer. Absolutely loves it. 50 prayers to five, but he's still rewarding you for 50 because he loves prayer. He wants you to be rewarded. He wants you to pray. He wants to make it easy for you, but you don't care. The majority of Muslims don't care. It's the best way to put it. We don't pray because we have to pray. 
We don't pray only because it's an obligation. We pray because we love Allah and we know that Allah loves it. So we love to please the one that we love. It's a simple analogy. Is it not? A simple fraction if you would like. It doesn't need rocket science. It's simple. And what does it do to us? It purifies us. It cleans us. It is the cure for the world's perplexing social filthy problems that exist from this madness that we live in. We need it. It's a mad, crazy, untamed, wild existence. Prayer is the cure for all of this. Well, like anyone who is sincere and genuine, when he prays, he will feel the tranquility and the serenity and the calmness descend upon him while he's praying and after he prays. That's what it does to you. Did he not say that? Whenever he feels some stress, Ya Bilal, relieve us with the prayer. He would say. There was a great scholar. I won't hold you too long. There was a great scholar by the name of Abu Muslim, a muhaddif, a zahid. He was ascetic to worldly possession, disown this world and what it contains. He was known to pray a lot, this great muhaddith. One day as he was praying, there was a man that walks past him and he looks at him, he goes, are you okay? Are you majnoon? You're always praying? Now, Abu Muslim is praying. So he couldn't reply to him at that particular situation. Well, stay. But after prayer, he replied to him in a nice, wise way. He goes, this is your akhi. This is not Junoon. This is the cure for Junoon. Oh, this is not Junoon. This is the cure for Junoon. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it so calming and relieving that we've got something called Salat in our deen? Seriously. You know, when you're in prostration, how do you feel? Honestly. I'm talking about the, the ones that really pray. How do you feel? That's why he didn't say pray. He said, Iqama to salah, to establish prayer. Big difference. We haven't got time for it now. Next time, inshallah. But how do you feel? Look, like how can anyone indulge, induce himself in a worldly atmosphere, entity, in sujood. Well, the closest time in your existence that you are close to Allah is when you prostrate. So how can anyone allow himself when he's so close to Allah, let his imagination or his mind or whatever travel? What am I going to eat after this? Should I only do one, so, you know, one tasbih? Should I go more? Should I make dua? Should I not? This is not sujood. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not sujood. This is the closest time to Allah Ta'ala. And you're, you're thinking. You're indulged in an atmosphere of devilish entities. Seriously? Treasure. The most important treasure that exists. Treasure it here. And that is Allahu Akbar. This is where it belongs. There is no greater treasure for a believer than Allah is greater. He. No one can touch it. No one can remove it. No one can steal it. No one. It's yours. Allah gave it to you. You make sure you treasure it.